So, um, thank you for giving up such a nice uh, sunny evening uh, to spend it in here with us. Uh, I hope we can make it feel worthwhile. I feel slightly a bit of an imposter with that title, Distinguished Speaker. I still feel like a very much a jobbing GP uh, who kind of got frustrated with how the system was going uh, and decided I would put my head above the parapet and say, well, stop moaning or get involved. Um, are we all right with the sound? Perfect. Okay, so um, a little bit about myself. I'm a GP. I've been a GP 22 years. I'm a partner, as Stephen said, in the, in, in the Hurley Group in South London and actually probably about 2007. We were a single practice in the Elephant and Castle uh, in a, quite a deprived part of London and um, our practice manager left and I decided to get involved more on the practice management side of events and uh, discovered the range of opportunities that were open to us to get involved in supporting other local practices and setting up new services. Um, and that kind of mushroomed out uh, in part because I was tempted by my wife who was working in a, in a practice in Peckham uh, as a GP um, where the practice was PCT run. Um, and the PCT had decided that they were going to put that out for tender and my wife didn't want to work for me but she didn't want to work for anybody else so we tendered for that practice and she was particularly precious about a, a service that she was running for asylum seekers and refugees uh, which she thought might be at risk. So we took over that practice and we looked at the sort of quality improvement that was analysed by the Nuffield over the space of the year with each of the partners from the Hurley going in, rolling up their sleeves and getting involved in some turnaround. Um, and actually at the end of the year we kind of stepped back and looked at the data and we thought actually we've done something above and beyond what happens in a regular practice with a patient in front of you but actually for a population. And we kind of caught the bug of service turnaround and actually expanded out from there to 15 practices in 10 CCGs in London looking after about 110,000 patients and about 350,000 urgent care or minor illness cases coming in to see us in a mixture of 111 services, uh, GP out of hours, uh, front ends of A&Es and minor injury units. So we built up a fairly, we went from 27 people in 2007 in our team to something around 350 now um, with another 200 working on a sessional basis around us. Um, but actually all that time, particularly around 2012, 13, 14, I was becoming increasingly frustrated with how general practice I felt was being undervalued. Um, so when the opportunity arose to take on this job, uh, I put my hat in the ring and here I am. So four months into the job, uh, in the midst of, you might recall, on the front cover of Pulse magazine, lots of green cards voting for undated resignations to be handed in at the LMC conference, um, actually trying to bring together a bit of a plan for how we turn general practice around. Um, so tonight I hope to tell you a little bit of the story behind that and actually some of the rationale for it uh, and also uh, give you an opportunity to kind of kick the tires on what was your thinking around doing it this way and I'm always open to new ideas. Um, so it might be worthwhile pausing on just understanding <coughs> Why is general practice that important? Possibly around 350 million appointments a year, um, which if you care, compare to say 23 million attendances and accident and emergency, gives you the sense of scale that general practice offers. Most countries would like to get to the version of general practice we've got today. We have a birth to death relationship potentially with one doctor or one set of doctors and, and, and a wider practice team uh, we've got a contemporaneous medical record uh, that goes throughout your lifetime, uh, looked after in your locality with 57 million people having the opportunity to register with a local service. They are your advocates, they are your navigators through the complexity that is the NHS. They are holding a lot of the purse strings of us as taxpayers and how, as they hold the NHS checkbook, uh, how they're using resources wisely. Um, they're kind of air traffic control through the system. And I would argue that actually, you know, it is absolutely the case that 
uh, general practice should feel really proud of the high regard in which it's held by the population. And in the context of the fact that the British population are most proud, ahead of the RAF and the royal family, of the NHS. But equally, I get a tracking survey every month of what is the British population worried about? And it's kind of alternating every month between Brexit and the NHS at the moment. So this is why general practice is important. And this is why we need to ensure that we reverse some of the issues that it's been facing. So what are the problems? Uh, well, we've had a decade of underinvestment, which NHS England, since its inception, has already started reversing. Um, we've had uh, workload pressures. If you had to kind of look at the root cause of everything that's going uh, the wrong direction in general practice previously, it would be the fact that actually it has absorbed work from um, community services, from social care, from hospitals, uh, and from increasing expectations in an aging population. So, actually general practice, some have described as saturated. The workforce crisis around general practice is uh, well known to everybody. In fact, I gave a reform lecture in two th uh, probably about four years ago where I, I talked about the fact that the workforce crisis in general practice was now inevitable um, and it will also therefore take some time to reverse. And then I don't think there's anyone out there who thinks the current model is any longer sustainable. Um, it is the case that we have to think about is it, is it uh, sustainable for people to continue working in this way under these pressures. We have to change and I think that comes from positive desires to transform but also actually because the day job has become unmanageable. So <clears throat> as I said in April, in fact on Saturday we'll have the second birthday of the general practice forward view which is I should remind you a five-year program up to 2021. Um, and therefore shouldn't be confused with the five-year forward view uh, whose end date is coming up earlier. And what we're going to do is walk through each of the five chapters of the general practice forward view and actually tell you a little bit about what's happening. So in terms of investment, it's probably worthwhile saying that the general practice forward view is 82 moving parts and initiatives that were brought together. And actually it's not Arvin Madden's plan, it's actually the profession's plan. This was done after an intense period of discussions, getting everybody's ideas from all the stakeholder organizations, including the RCGP and the BMA, of what should we be doing here, guys? And everybody agreed there was no silver bullet, so we are in the territory of silver buckshot. So actually, when I collect that together and I go in and see Simon Stevens and Jeremy Hunt say, this is what we think we should be doing, actually, it is the case that we had to stack up the individual business cases around each of the problems that general practice was facing. So the downside, the upside of that is we secured 2.4 billion extra investment, which is a step change in the trajectory of investment in general practice um, by 2021. And that is recurrent. And we are on track to achieve that. Uh, the downside of it is because we had to do it in that slightly piecemeal fashion, it feels like quite a disjointed offer for commissioners to, uh, and providers to embed into what feels like uh, a meaningful change to the system. But this is a 14% real terms increase in investment in comparison to an 8% increase in investment currently earmarked for the rest of the NHS. So this is an attempt to correct the decade of underinvestment uh, that has gone into general, uh, that general practice has struggled with. Where has some of that money gone? As I mentioned, we are on track to make that investment. We're asking CCGs to stomp up three pounds ahead and actually our current tracking and assurance processes around that tell us we are on track to receive that. Uh, it's gone on additional appointment capacity, so about 54% of the country today can access extended evening and weekend hours. Um, global sum was increased for payments to GPs. Uh, 30 million has gone into last year's indemnity. 60 million has gone into this year's indemnity. So practice was, practices have just received a payment of about a pound a head um, for this year. And and if I'd stood here, I don't know, even yet a year ago and said to you, uh, in a year's time, we will be on track. We'll we will have a state-backed indemnity scheme for general practice in, from 2019, April 2019. <clears throat> I think I probably would have been laughed out of the room. Um, but actually, we are now uh, working pretty bloody hard, frankly, to try and get to a point where we can uh, put that in place. 
uh, whereby we want to move to a model where insurance and indemnity uh, sits at a higher level than individual doctors, which is a bit of a, you know, the indemnity issue was a bit of a lightning rod for dissatisfaction in the profession because it feels really unfair at a time when successful claims for negligence are actually going down for indemnity <coughs> inflation to be hitting about 10% in routine general practice. And we all know that the costs of being an urgent care doctor, you're talking about 13,000 just to get in the game. And actually for some doctors, it, it rises substantially more. Um, so indemnity is one of the key issues that we're, we're tackling. Uh, 10 million for the winter indemnity scheme to encourage doctors around capacity for the winter. Uh, improvements to some of the other areas. I won't go through them all, um, but uh, I'll just pick out the AUA. So the unplanned admissions enhanced service, I would characterize as that 157 million we moved into the global sum for general practice was an example of us moving away from a biomedical model of micro incentives to get little things to happen and t boxes ticked to actually saying, okay, well, what are we actually doing for 57 million people and can we be smarter about identifying using something like the frailty index who we are you know who we might be able to avoid over medicalizing uh, in their treatment and actually be more discerning over uh, for example how we target our resources on things like diabetes it's really important to be aggressive around diabetes management when you're in your 20s 30s 40s but is it in your 70s and 80s to prevent uh, long-term uh, illnesses uh, and complications, well then you might want to take a more tailored approach. So being a bit more sophisticated in how we do things. 10 million to implement the e-referral system. Most people know that actually we're kind of part way through that process where half the system is paper and half the system is electronic and if we don't get over that hump then actually we're not much better off than if we were all paper. So actually uh, we'll move on from that dual running proposition. Uh, 27.4 million went in 16-17 uh, uh, to 2100 practices for the general practice resilience program. And actually we adopted a really permissive approach around how that should be used and actually changed our approach in, uh, after listening to the profession. What many people may not know is that in the ICS areas, the integrated care system areas of which there are 10 around the country, the sort of the, the STPs that are being uh, accelerated a little bit, uh, a pound a head has gone into general practice and maturing that faster in those areas, as did into the primary care homes, which is now covering 14% of the country. I'll come back to that bit of the story. Uh, CQCs is now no longer such a, uh, a difficult issue given that it's fully reimbursed. But actually, as I said, I think the root cause of most of our issues is around the workload we're currently asking our GPs to do. Uh, and if we start to unpack that a little bit, we need to be thinking about how we get smarter around demand management. That 350 million requests for appointments, in fact, the requests are probably more than the supply. Uh, Self-help and patient online, better signposting, care navigation, social prescribing, all of these propositions are now starting slowly to come to life and actually what we're seeing is bits of this in bits of the country and actually the ambition here I should just be clear is that all of it is everywhere ultimately. Um, open access to allied health professionals so to give you a flavor of what that might look like uh, we're hoping in 18-19 in each of the 44 STP areas in the country to have at least a primary care network so about a 50,000 population sized pilot around direct access to musculoskeletal services. So you don't have to go see the GP first for your knee pain or your back pain. You can go straight to a physiotherapist. Now we know that these pilots are popping up around the country already. What we want to do is work out actually what is the secret source or the blueprint for the formula that actually works so that the population can start to see these services directly without necessarily taking up a GP appointment to get there and actually industrialize that approach. So in 36 months, starting from now, we have the whole 57 million people being able to directly access musculoskeletal services without going through their GP. Which if you ask the physio world is 30% of appointments. We GPs in the room know that's not entirely true because that might be true if you take into account the fact that most patients or many patients often come in with two, three, four problems. There are also reforms happening in the 111 and urgent care space. 
uh, that are happening in parallel. So to give you some examples, 111 online, I'll come back to that when we talk about the digital, uh, but actually also things like uh, expanding the range of professionals who are available uh, to uh, callers when they call a, a 111 number. Um, so not just our nurses, uh, but pharmacists, GPs, mental health professionals, dentists. 8% of calls to 111 are dental. And actually getting to a point, ideally by 2021, where 50% of callers, we're currently sitting around, I think, a 30% level, where 50% of callers are able to speak to a clinician and think about the workload impact if those clinicians are able to close a higher proportion of those 15 million calls a year to 111. And we're also, there's some other things that I won't go into much detail about, but pharmacists in 111 is another great example. They're now, in many parts of the country, dealing with repeat prescription requests on the weekend. They don't go to the GP out of hours service anymore. That's the NUMSUS pilot. In the north of England, there are 35 minor conditions uh, whereby if you ring 111, um, they will make you an appointment in a local pharmacy. I think there's about 300 pharmacies involved in that pilot. But actually the plan is if that's working on the evaluation and we have to get to kind of bottom that one out, why is that not everywhere in the country? Those 35 minor conditions represent a significant chunk of what is currently burdening GPs that may not need to in the future. What are we doing inside the practice? Well, I'll come on to increasing staff numbers, but I mentioned the resilience program, and I'll go on to the general practice development program, which I would say is bigger than maybe people realize. 30 million pounds is going into the general practice development program, which is the biggest organizational development investment in primary care anywhere ever on earth. So actually, if you're not engaged with that and enjoying the benefits of what that might bring, please do. Uh, we're investing in practice manager training and creating a network so they can share best practice and various other activities in the practice managers event, which actually has been de designed by the practice managers themselves in four uh, regional conferences. Um, upskilling staff. So some of you will be aware that um, many practices are now enjoying the benefit of GP saving on average 40 minutes a day from clinical correspondence, which used to be about 100 letters and things every day, now being down to the region of 5, 10, 15 letters a day, because actually we've got smart about how we route clinical documentation by training up somewhere in the region of 2100 um, clinical correspondence handlers, and we're not done yet, we've only just started. The other one around that is care navigation. So we have now trained 12,000, 12,100 in fact, uh, staff in care navigation, and this again is another thing that's starting to produce capacity benefits in, in practices. Career coaching, we've had, I think, somewhere in the region of 300 GPs enjoy that benefit of 318, uh, been through career coaching, two sessions, which they've hugely valued. The feedback is exceptional. They said the course was a bit short, uh, so we're making that three sessions for the next 320 something uh, who will be, who approved this year. And I know that we had about 2,000 applications for that, and we are going to look at whether we expand that proposition, particularly as actually the career intentions of those GPs who go through that career coaching uh, actually means that uh, a proportion of them are deciding to stay for longer because they've had their eyes open to other propositions that make the day feel or the week feel more sustainable through portfolio options, etc. The General Practitioner Health Service. Uh, this is the service that looks after doctors or is available to doctors and uh, all doctors in London and all general practitioners and GP trainees in the rest of the country. And since uh, kicking off in January, they've had contact with about 1,200 doctors, which is in one level an indictment of the pressure in the system, but at now at least those doctors are getting that support for mental health issues, addiction issues, um, and that's some difficult territory. And again, there, the evidence is suggesting the support that is given is keeping these folk able to work. What can the system do to help? Well, simplify reporting and regulation. I think we've all seen the mushroom cloud of requests from all the arm's length bodies. And so, so, so actually, what we need to do is try and declutter that environment. I think I went into NHS England with a view that general practitioners are possibly the most uh, 
scrutinized uh, professionals in the NHS. Um, and actually what we've done is we now have a concordat, which is a posh name for an agreement between GMC and NHS England and CQC to sit down and declutter the requests on EDEC. So we're not asking GPs for marginally different information several times and then uh, and we can kind of streamline that process. We all know that there are issues with the payment system. Those of you who have seen the Making Time in General Practice report, it was the number one complaint uh, of practice managers up and down the land. They're spending about a day a week chasing money from different commissioners and reconciling that. That's not okay. That's, that's time they should be pointing at patients. We need to tidy up that system, but a bigger problem than it sounds. Uh, and moving away from micro incentives I touched on already. We also need a bit of a reset in our relationship with hospitals and our acute sector colleagues. Uh, the five-year uh, five forward view and the next step document talks about dissolving the boundary between primary and secondary care. We've set up a primary secondary care interface group, which is actually one of the bodies we've used to try and socialize the messaging around the changes to the standard contract. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the standard contract between CCGs and hospitals asks hospitals to try and tidy up that whole hospital episode, for example, in an outpatient. Please ensure the GPs are informed in 24 hours of what's happening uh, from A&E, from a ward. Please ensure they have enough medication. Please do the fit note if you know they're going to be off work for six weeks. Um, these are fairly straightforward things, and we're trying to make that the norm. Uh, and actually, some of you may have seen, uh, I think in the next few days or weeks, we're distributing 100 leaflets, patient-facing leaflets, uh, to help patients know what they should be expecting. Please give the results of the tests. Please don't send the patient back to us before you sent us the discharge summary, because we won't know what to do either. And please don't ask us to chase their next appointment. Put that on your letter so patients can contact you directly. But actually, it's not all one way. We did, do need to work with our hospital colleagues to ensure that we hit that fertile ground of efficiencies that work for them too. And one of the things is around electronic referrals, um, although I think that can be positioned in a way that is a win-win for everybody. So to give you an example, uh, advice and guidance, some of the enhancements there. To give you another example, referral assess assessment services, particularly taken off in places like Tower Hamlets in East London, where now their renal services are being uh, moved to that format and they're piloting another 10 services whereby a referral isn't quite a referral, it's a request for help and is triaged very rapidly by the specialist who can then decide, is it a message back to the GP? Is it I pick up the phone to the patient? Is it I call this patient in for an outpatient after I've done these tests? So actually we're kind of redesigning what it means to be uh, in a communication with a, with, a, with a specialist and what that means for patients. And actually the ability to, to start sending us remote specialist advice so that we can start looking after uh, our more complex patient, patients better in the community and doing it in a timely way, not waiting three months. Think of the journey, think of the, think of the value that it says we're giving to patients time when we say, yeah, you, you wait there for three months and the specialist will send you a letter uh, and then you'll go in and it might be better, it might be worse, it might be you never needed it and you worried for three months. So actually we're trying to disrupt some of those uh, pathways in the system. And another thing that I can see that's going to start increasingly adding resilience to the system and helping with workload is collective working across groups of practices, uh, which I'm going to be uh, coming back to. But actually that's certainly an area where I've seen Groups of practices working in that collective way have meant the survival of an individual practice that had a, a partner death or, or an incident uh, whereby that practice would have gone under had the other practices and the access hub and other things not been around to support them. So if we move on to workforce, you all have seen the headlines. We are struggling uh, to recruit 5,000 Doctors working in general practice, I use that phrase very carefully because it's doctors working in general practice. It includes registrars and it includes any specialists who start working in general practice alongside us. But it is 5,000 whole time equivalent. Um, and that means it may be eight, nine, 10,000 headcount because participation rates is one of our major issues. Um, and by participation rates, it means, uh, what I mean is how full time 
the profession is. For every GP senior partner who might retire today, we might need to recruit one and a half doctors uh, because they're doing 0.6, because the day job's that tough. So we need to think through these things. So what are we doing around encouraging recruitment? Well, you've heard already about the 1,500 extra medical students, 500 this year, another 1,000 next year. We'll get to 7,500. This is fantastic news. We are targeting uh, medical schools that are good at turning out the doctors the NHS needs, not necessarily the ones they want to become. Uh, we have a service to run, uh, which is mainly general practice and psychiatry. Uh, and we see a big range across medical schools from 8% to about 35% in what proportion of their turnout become GPs. Uh, so we've been quite targeted in how we've done that. We've got 3,250 uh, health education in England training places. Uh, we've been successful in recruiting 3,157, so just shy of that target. But what it does mean is we've got more GPs in training than ever before in history. Um, which Health Education England are to be congratulated for. They've done a great job. We need to go further. We need to have all of them. Um, we also have post-CCT fellowships and we have recruitment campaigns and CSUs are getting involved in helping practices who are struggling to recruit to market. Uh, and we have the International Recruitment Program. And we've increased the scale of that program from an ambition of 500 GPs to now 2,000, and to be honest, we'll take more if we can get more. We are battling against the vibe in the system that is Brexit, uh, and that's uh, proving troublesome. I mean, we know of examples where uh, GPs have pulled out of propositions on the back of uh, this, this sentiment, or their perception of this sentiment. Um, and actually what we need to do is ensure that in the local program, and I was uh, talking to one of the colleagues around here, earlier was telling me the effort that's going involved to make sure these guys stick when they come. They feel welcome, they feel supported, they are, they're given the help uh, to bed in, not just from the perspective of uh, the professional arrangements and in that practice and what that feels like and what does the prospectus say and all the rest of it, but actually also in terms of their dependents, their children getting places in local schools, their spouses getting local jobs feeling like they're hitting uh, a community they can identify with and supporting them through that. And we've started to see, we've started to learn lessons from some of the pre-pilots, if you like, in Lincolnshire and Essex and uh, Humber. Um, but actually we've set up the, the program now. This is the moment at which we'll find uh, out whether we have put off our European colleagues from joining um, because we're just about to go out to recruit. The other thing is we're also seeing whether we can entice any GPs back from Bondi Beach in Australia um, and actually working with the Royal College and GMC about whether, what the parallels are between the curriculums and what the hurdles might be to start enticing. And actually you'd be surprised, some want to come back uh, and the current system doesn't help them as it should. Uh, we, I'll say it again, probably uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is how do we make general practice more attractive, which is actually you know, the cause of the workforce issues. We had a target of 500 through the induction and refresher program. We've probably got about 200 and something GPs back to work and another uh, 200 in the pipeline. Um, but we're seeing significant applications coming in there. So we, we, we're likely to hit our targets on the induction and refresher scheme. But as I say, we want to go bigger on everything we can. Uh, 200 salary supplement scheme. So this is £20,000 uh, as a salary supplement scheme to junior GPs who want to go work, who are willing to work in areas that are considered underdoctored. Actually, some of them sound quite nice to me. Uh, so £20,000 to go work in Cumbria, I would do that if I was at the beginning of my career. Uh, but actually, it's enticing those doctors to go to those areas. And anecdotally, what we're hearing is those doctors are putting that money down as deposits on properties. So that suggests they might stick. Interestingly, uh, the evidence, I think, suggests that 50% of doctors stick in the area they train. So that might be a, of interest to colleagues here. Um, we've improved the retainer scheme with financial inducements both for the doctor and for the practice, and that's become, we've certainly increased the number substantially to about 230, uh, I think. But bearing in mind that the scheme kind of fell into abeyance, and there were years when we were getting 30. So, we're trying to rev up that engine. And training hubs around, around each area. 
On retention, 600 career coaching places, 1,100 through the GP Health Service and 11 uh, through the GP Career Plus pilots. Now, these are pilots that actually appoint one body to hold the employment of a number of GPs within a particular geography so they can develop a relationship with a community of practices as a community of clinicians themselves and develop their own portfolio alongside that with some subsidies for some of their overhead costs like indemnity and DBS and GMC costs, etc. So an enticement to stay in a community. But actually, this is one of the things that we need to really reconsider. You know, what have we done to general practice in the space of a decade that's meant that when I wanted to be a partner, there was, you know, 20 people applying for the job. And now, if you walk into a room full of juniors, you say, which of you want to be a partner? And actually, nobody puts their hands up. So we are doing the partnership review and starting to think about what is what are some of the lessons, perhaps north of the border, uh, that we might learn uh, around what's happening? Um, it's not just about the doctors. We recognise, in the, in the way that actually our practice nurses are a hugely valued part of the team, we now have the opportunity to expand that further to a wide range of primary healthcare professionals. So pr our practice managers need support in gearing up to the, what the new world will be. Uh, pharmacists, we're expanding that out to one per 30,000 and there's about 500 or 694 in post and 587 for phase uh, that's just been launched uh, and pharmacists working in 111 and care homes um, 3,000 therapists for the long-term physical uh, conditions a thousand physician associates we've got 32 educational institutions around the country who are training up uh, physician associates and we believe that they will have great utility to the system when we're trying to sort out things like regulation and their ability to prescribe. Paramedics, well we've got a great example and thank you to John Ribchester for inviting me here today uh, and giving me the opportunity to see his practice. I think his practice is an example of many things but also of paramedic home visiting. I certainly use you in all my examples John so thank you. Um, physiotherapists I've touched on, care navigation and clinical correspondence handling. So that's some sense of what's happening in relation to the workforce. I won't dwell long on the Estates and Technology Fund, um, but we have a pipeline, a three-year pipeline of how we're going to invest, uh, and we've got 844 schemes up and running and another 868 in the pipeline. This is really hard because you put aside money to do premises and actually you overcommit uh, and you're accused of overcommitting and some will inevitably not be fundable. You undercommit, or you commit to the to the, and, and some fall out due to due diligence. So it's kind of landing on a postage stamp stuff. Um, but there are lots of really clever people looking at how we do this effectively. And here's an example of a practice in Coventry that's been a beneficiary. Um, technology: an 18% increase in funding. Although I do accept that some of that's pointed at things that previously were paid for elsewhere. Um, but actually, this is this is one of our really key enablers to how we change how general practice operates in terms of patient facing activity, in terms of uh, clinician to clinician support and in terms of how we automate the back office. So in terms of patient facing activity, just to pick one, we get about 50 million hits on uh, NHS choices every month. Can we honestly say we're utilising that traffic to the best ability to, uh, to actually help empower patients. Well, we're working on that in the conversion over to NHS UK and moving it into a more transactional range of offers. We know there's an explosion of apps and wearables uh, and actually increasingly, I think in the future, I, I, I fantasize about a world whereby I come down to breakfast every morning, open up my laptop and over breakfast, I can see the 40, 50 patients of mine who've self-helped in the last 24 hours with a range of self-help, signposts, symptom checking, whatever it is. And then I can work out which patients need uh, some support that I can provide remotely, uh, either asynchronously or synchronously, which can go into an appointment slot for the 10, 20 patients who actually would benefit from a longer slot with me face to face. I think that's a version of general practice I would really enjoy. And, and I spend some of my time looking at data analytics to work out why my asthmatics are going to hospital more than the practices down the road. And what can I do about that? Summary care records are coming into pharmacies, so they will be having uh, greater visibility of patients' issues, uh, and also NHS mail going into uh, practice pharmacies. We've got about 5,000 practices now on Wi-Fi around the country. 
bear in mind, this is all in the last 24 months, so the pace of change is actually pretty substantial. Online consulting, phone triage, uh, so the investment's gone out in relation to those to give patients the ability to send in the story rather than always come in. But actually, don't just send in the story. Look at all the self-management tools first. So we walk them past the doors of other opportunities to feel empowered about how they manage their care. Lots of in-house uh, tech, but actually resetting that relationship with the hospital in how we do advice and guidance, decision support, I think. Unified coding in the form of SNOMED will start helping us automate how we code information back in practice without sitting there, at least in my practice, with a yellow highlighter pen trying to point out the diagnosis. And as I said, around health analytics, we are about to see an explosion in the data available to clinicians to collectively change their behaviours uh, that actually start to address some of the unwarranted variation in the system that might just be the way we produce some financial headroom for reinvestment into primary care. So looking at how we're redesigning the service, the big five enablers in my mind are how we help patients to manage or feel more independent around their healthcare needs. How we use technology uh, in the way I've just described. How we support the growth and enrichment of the primary care workforce. Uh, how we're going to work together at scale and how we align our financial incentives. So if we start to look at some of the other things that are happening around us. I've already touched on uh, some of these already, how we're going to extend access. So I've received differing advice from our comms team on this one. We are uh, in the, we, I mentioned earlier, where 54% of the country is now covered by access hubs uh, or similar under different names, uh, whereby patients have the ability to, in addition to their own practice, have access to a GP or nurse or wider team uh, in that neighbourhood uh, in evenings and weekends. And that's to be determined locally between patients and commissioners and providers what is the right mix of what that looks like. Um, but actually that has given us the opportunity to kind of scale that model out so 100% of the country, 57 million people have access to a neighbourhood access hub so they can get a GP appointment. And actually, we want to give the status of that appointment almost the same as the status in the mind of the receptionist handing out the appointment as an in-house appointment in the event that it's not an appointment that requires continuity. But actually, create that additional capacity of many millions of appointments in the system. Uh, and the differing advice I've been given to me by the comms team has been, Arvind, everyone's really nervous every time you talk about seven-day services. But actually, I don't view this as necessarily just better access for patients. It's more capacity for general practice. And actually, isn't that what we're trying to do when we're chasing 5,000 extra doctors, etc.? And actually, what we're discovering is about a third of those appointments are being offered in core hours. So it's an absolute direct support for patients uh, and for practitioners when they're feeling at the end of their tether and the appointment book looks like it can't get any fuller. Um, and a third of it happens in the evenings on weekdays and about a third happens on the weekends of which about two thirds is on Saturday and about a third is on Sunday. That's the rough split at the current time. So my point being that this is absolutely something that I be believe will be a big support in workload terms to GPs up and down the land. Certainly in the practices that I work in when that's available to me as another option down the road when I'm the duty doctor it feels a help. Uh, urgent and emergency care, other points I've already mentioned, pharmacy transformation I've already touched on. <clears throat> the Time for Care programme, I did mention this earlier, but if you want to go to our, uh, just as a general point, the NHS England web pages are a fabulous resource. We try and load everything up there. There's 130 case studies on all of these things, so it's not just us saying in a dry way, hypothetically, these things might work. It's real practices loading up their case studies to share with others, saying this is how we cracked it in our town. Um, but this is about spreading innovation. It's about actually deep dives with teams in CCGs. I think these numbers are slightly higher now. We're certainly way over half of CCGs have practices involved in the Time for Care program and the 10 high impact actions and the things that we can do to start to release capacity in practices. Like I said at the beginning, what we all know is that the current model is not sustainable. And what we all know is that we need the right patients in front of the cl right clinician uh, if we're to improve things. And building that capability into the system. So we've now had 
a thousand plus uh, primary care folk attend a six day residential course. I think it's three sets of two days uh, whereby quality improvement techniques uh, are, um, they, they, they have training in a number of uh, facets of that uh, and they take those back. So that actually this hopefully isn't a sort of three year program that then fades away, but actually we're training the cohort of individuals who will champion this in their areas. And there's lots of programs that sit around that. If you're a younger GP in the room, Next Gen, I advise you to look it up. There's about 350 Next Gen GPs around the country now. Uh, they're having their big conference. Simon Stevens is going to go and talk to them at the Oval in a couple of weeks. Um, this is really exciting stuff. This, this was our attempt to get to you before you got contaminated and cynical um, by the system. Um, so what we also know is that practices are starting to work together. And some believe, uh, some people could give you lots of the science around why 30 to 50,000? Why 100 to 150 clinicians? And they can wax lyrical about the fact that that's how many people you can know the first name of on your mobile. Uh, that's how centurions uh, happen in, in Rome. Uh, that's how uh, ape packs grow in, in, the, in their collectives. Uh, I, from my point of view, I was in Tower Hamlets in 2007. I was in a network. Uh, I saw that if you had four or five practices, you'd know when someone didn't show up uh, and it would matter because you couldn't really get it done. If you were 10 practices, it was a little more tricky. Uh, so it's, it's kind of the unit that felt small enough to care and big enough to cope and impactful on a population level of 50,000. 50, it's a unit at which um, it, you can deliver another layer of services into the system. Uh, that you can't do at a practice level in practical terms uh, and don't need to be in a hospital because we want patients to receive the best access to the best care close to home where it's the right business model. Um, so these are some of the things that we're organically developing in the system. But what we're now doing is, let's say, if this is the way the system has organically developed, I mentioned earlier primary care homes now covers 14% of the country, then actually, why are we not accelerating this grassroots movement and giving it the support it needs to actually make it the new service delivery unit of the future? So 1,400, say, across the country that actually can do stuff for patients and support resilience amongst practitioners in a way that you can't really easily achieve with 7,300 practices. And actually, I would argue it kind of localizes and makes it real for your neighborhood of care, your community of clinicians. Um, some of the products in the general practice forward view, which kind of feel a bit over there to a lot of people. It's not a program that will work if you're passive. You have to kind of stand up. And I can see examples all the time of practices that are really extracting a lot of value from the program. But equally, I see too many practices who really have kind of expected it to come to them, and it hasn't. And they're uh, understandably cynical as a result. But actually, if this model of the world um, is to become the new architecture. And we have said uh, in the refresh of the planning guidance this year, we are encouraging every CCG to have primary care networks of 30 to 50,000 patients worth of practices, uh, which are geographically contiguous by the end of the next financial year. And if that's the, if that's the new service delivery unit, and this isn't just a signal to providers, it's a signal to commissioners that this is the new uh, way of doing business, um, then I think that's a really strong message. But it is up to us now to decide this year what's going in there. What will a primary care network actually do? Is it just a memorandum of understanding a bunch of, with a bunch of practices that sits on a shelf? Or actually, is this really going to revolutionize care in the way we want it to and make the 82 initiatives in the general practice forward view meaningful in my neighborhood and in my practice. So how is it going to relate to the person? How is it going to relate to the practice? How is it going to bring together that whole primary care network? And how are they going to in relate to a federation? So maybe, in my mind at least, this is providing clarity to the role that federations could play in the new world. An integrator function, an aggregator function, a back office function. It might be the employer of staff working in a primary care network function. It might be the unit through which uh, we coalesce primary care networks who might decide they want to go and do something bigger around accountable care or an MCP. 
um, it's all up for grabs. But it's for us to give a steer, be clear with commissioners, this is the new, new direction of travel, uh, but not let's, let's not get bogged down in primary care networks necessarily becoming legal entities. Um, it doesn't matter who employs the staff, it's the function they serve uh, for patients. So if we, for example, start to think about what primary care networks let us do, and I would largely ignore the top and bottom box. These are, these are kind of um, slightly expanded version of general practice and where we might be going with urgent care, but think about the middle box. And this isn't, this isn't me saying this is how we're going to do it. This is me trying to bring to life a range of services that might be deliverable in, in this way. Might it be the case that the new offer to the public, for example, is, yes, of course you can still see your GP through a variety of modalities. It might be online, it might be on the phone, it might be like this, you can use 111, and accident emergency is, of course, always there. But actually, here's a whole other range of professionals, giving them the status they deserve in the system. The IAPS professional, who can be seeing patients maybe directly for some issues. The, the physio or the uh, OTs, the opportunity to actually start to broaden out a suite of offers visible to the public as this is how you can do it instead of always necessarily going by your GP. Why does a woman have to wait two weeks for a GP appointment to get a form filled in to go and book in for antenatal? It's stopping in some parts of the country. What we're saying is these might be models that we can take further. Social prescribing link workers, health trainers, a range of professionals could be sitting in you know, what might be described as a polysystem approach to the world. And actually, the opportunity to not just tidy up a range of existing services, we already do family planning direct, we already do uh, GUM services direct. But not just to tidy that up, but actually, if we have this new platform, then actually it's an opportunity to develop out a whole new range of services. The paramedics visiting all the practices patients, the frailty team and the contribution they could make uh, to supporting patients with severe frailty, which we can now diagnose through our uh, EFI on our computers and actually taking a different approach to some of these services. So I'm not going to dwell too long on all of this. I think the benefits are pretty uh, self-evident of taking this approach to the new scaffolding that we might create uh, around organising general practice and primary care. Resilient, sustainable, individual, so it can be big and small, uh, supported by uh, efficient, effective and timely input from other services. Specifically, patients, I hope, will experience a more joined up service, a more enriched service, a service where there's an opportunity around different forms of access and digital by desire is currently one of the buzz phrases. Um, and having the right professional spending the right amount of time with the right patients and actually being discerning about how we filter patients and flow patients to the right services. But also equally being respectful of the choices they might want to make within that. So we don't take away uh, the continuity of care. We maybe have bigger practices, but we have micro teams within those practices to solve some of those issues. And there's nothing stopping you on a digital offer to actually make a preference for a, a doctor, but be knowing that that's going to be three days away instead of immediately. Those are the sorts of choices we should be building in. It may be where we start to cite our diagnostic services, and actually we know that there's a revolution there too. We know that we can get smarter about how we target anticoagulants with genomics. We know we can start thinking about uh, familial hypercholesterolemia and which statin is going to be the best one. So actually, as these things start to roll out, um, I think we're going to start to see the ability to do population-based care and personalised care. Uh, but it's being smart about the design of the service. And then wider stakeholders, the opportunity for commissioners to actually engage clinicians in the commissioning process. We don't want to be absorbed by it, but actually we want to be involved with it. Um, and I think that the, the revolution we're going to see in analytical data will support that. And I know that we operate in an NHS with a bit of an acute sector bias. And that acute sector bias is largely, in my mind, driven by the data we choose to collect. And then also appears on the 9 o'clock news. So your four-hour target and your et cetera, et cetera. So we are making a really concerted effort to actually 
go beyond where we are at the moment, which is deep pools of information in some areas of general practice, but some really big blank blind spots, like how many appointments happened in general practice last year. That's not okay not to know. So there's a huge amount of work happening in that space to get that all in order. And if, for example, you believe a little bit of, okay, well, if we did make workload a little bit better, and if we had some success with the workforce, we're not doing great on the GP numbers, but we're, we had a 5,000 target for allied health professionals. We're up to 3,800, two, two years into a five-year program, so I think we'll overshoot the runway there, which is great. Um, if you believe that actually some of this digital stuff will come to fruition and actually working at scale will give us traction for all of this to start really motoring and actually using data for that collective clinical behavior change, for that reinvestment cycle, back into the accelerating maturation of the primary care network and all of that it can offer. I don't believe any country anywhere internationally has optimized the role that primary care can play. Um, but I think we are one of the best place to try. 57 million people, one health system, uncontaminated by payment at the point of delivery. I think we're in a good place to try. So if, for example, we had empowered patients who were able to use digital offers, where we're able to start really industrializing our approach to care navigation, a local directory of service. I know you have versions of, of this locally what we're going to do around social prescribing, how we wire up the third workforce that is currently floundering out. And we're, we're, we're rich in this country with the level of uh, voluntary sector involvement. What we're really bad at at the moment is wiring them into actually uh, general practice and primary care because we know a lot of what we're seeing in our consulting rooms is not clinical at the moment. And how we uh, start to use community pharmacy more effectively. Um, I think we started in a difficult place in that relationship. We put a patient's flu jab in the middle and started saying, come here and come here. This, that, that territory is ripe for joint working, particularly around long-term conditions and particularly around what near patient testing and tech will do. How we start to route patients more effectively and triage so we're smarter about which patients see the GP. We'll still need A&E services. We'll, we need that reset in our relationship with the acute sector. Uh, and I think that the opportunity that um, access hubs, that new layer in the system uh, will offer us will be substantial. So in summary, two years into the five year program, in the last 24 months, we've been busy. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we're very good at telling the story, uh, which is why I'm always keen to take up opportunities to come and talk. Um, but I think what I would say is, We've laid the foundation for what could be a really exciting transformation, but we need to get the sustainability piece right. And I, and I absolutely get, as a GP who sees patients, my on-call day is Tuesday, and when I say on-call day, it's for 24 hours, and I do one in five weekends, so I do one, one, one. I, do a &E. I was in King's A&E till midnight last night, and I will be doing my clinics with substance misusers next weekend. So I get how tough it is at the front line, uh, so I feel the pain, but I would say we are on a journey and I'm therefore cautiously optimistic. Thank you. I'll stop there.